To the curious, the seekers, and the experts, welcome. You're listening to PolyPsych Podcast. Political controversies have seemingly touched virtually every aspect of American life, not least among those aspects, social media, and the ways in which we have recently become accustomed to communicating with one another, online, rather than face-to-face or even voice-to-voice. Twitter recently announced they will no longer accept ad money from those proposing to promote a political candidate or even a political cause. What is behind Twitter's at Jack's decision, and what does it mean? What will be the likely fallout? The PolyPsych podcast team has decided to consider the Twitter ad ban carefully. I'm Cindy, INFJ, Enneagram 2 Wing 1, and with me today to consider the Twitter ad ban are Ken. Hello, Ken. Hi, Cindy. And Don. Hi, Don. Hello, Cindy and Ken. Ken, would you be so kind as to introduce this topic of Twitter's ad ban? Sure. I think what we'll do, we're going to go through Jack's, um, Jack Dorsey's statement regarding um, his decision to stop all, I guess the will group decision, obviously, to stop all political advertising on Twitter globally. And the um, f- format that was, this was originally delivered in tweet form, which is interesting. I think, and we see this trend increasingly is when people have a have a big thought they need to chop it up into little bits um so it was a little bit it was somewhat inaccessible and it's one of the limitations of the twitter art form and it is an art form it's sort of like our modern version of haiku and i I have a lot of respect for the company for what they've created um and although they don't own the interchange, it runs on public monopoly infrastructure. We'll be addressing that issue here. But why don't we go through? I, I think I'll read the first paragraph and then Cindy, um, you know, take it from there and we'll probably discuss each one briefly as we go through it. And this uh, started at uh, was his Jack's first tweet was at 4.05 p.m. on October 30th. And to quote, We've made the decision to stop all political advertising on Twitter globally. We believe political message reach should be earned, not bought. Why? Question mark. A few reasons. And then he'll he'll go into that. But how, what do you think of the framing there, Don or Cindy? Well, it does rub me the wrong way. Um, the um, his uh, what I think is a an artificial dichotomy between um, the buying of information and the sharing of it. Um, It doesn't have to be either or. Basically, he's ignoring the fact that money is, like you said, it's it's public monopoly money, and that is fueling it. Um, And so the idea is that whoever has access to that public money, therefore, they should be given full reign. And, and that's blatantly false. It's, there needs to be some kind of control over public money. And there are agencies that are set up to do that, but that's not happening at the moment. But that's another discussion. Anyway, uh, that was my reaction. It kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Money being evil and associated with greed. Um, and, you know, it's um, it's really a less it's not a neutral way to think about money. I, I saw this. I thought the, the word globally was interesting, probably inevitable, but that's, um, although the statement was presented in the somewhat informal frame of tweets, we've extracted it as you'll see on the visual. And I believe it was very well thought out. There are no typos anywhere. And it was obviously a group product. Um, the concept of reach, interesting, interesting uh, word. And I think humans are social creatures and we really don't achieve what you would call reach without an interchange of, of social connection. And so I'm not sure how Jack has, I think he's aware of the ambiguity of this statement and the um, fallacy contained within. And that if we just work in our backyards and don't get out and talk to anybody where the human species is just is done we don't have 
any ability to earn influence without social interchange. And the gray area where we distinguish between that which is earned and bought is, is, a, is, a, is another fallacy. Again, we're dealing with public infrastructure, with um, public utility infrastructure that is powered by, in our system, at least the um, interchange of, of monetary units in one form or another. So I'm not sure. I guess we'll, we'll, find, we'll see as we progress through it and see what, exactly how do you earn in this new world that he's trying to frame us into believing exists. Cindy, if you could, uh, do you want to continue with paragraph two? Sure. A political message earns reach when people decide to follow an account or retweet. Paying for reach removes that decision, forcing highly optimized and targeted political messages on people. We believe this decision should not be compromised by money." End quote. Yeah, Don, that was a, a good point. Um, it looks like a little bit of um, using that value judgment that money bad, and then some other method of, um, of, of getting through and connecting is good, would not really specified. But it's interesting, and we'll, we'll get into this, is the second part of this show will be studying one of the companies that sits off to the side as a service provider, providing various services uh, to kind of corral and uh, filter content. And the one we've chosen to study in detail is, is new knowledge now known as Yonder. But both in both cases, we see the entity, Jack here as a, as a lead, a thought leader, self-appointed, casting his, his um, he's standing up for the rights of people in his, in his mind, at least, or at least as, as it's presented to us, in a, in a situation where there are blank entities having something forced upon them, which is, a, it's an interesting parent-child paradigm that we just kind of pass by as we're reading. But it's, it's quite astounding, really, that he's, he's elevated himself to that level and regards everyone out there in his in in the the twitter sphere as incapable of of discernment yeah i agree the the whole idea of um well one thing to keep in mind here is what's what is not being explicitly said and i think you've nailed it ken it's that the the idea is that we know what's best for you. We know people. We uh, are above money. And that whole posturing is, is, I think, dishonest. And it needs to be exposed. So um, that's what we're doing here. We're saying, wait a minute. Um, you are going to be the arbiter because it's not as if that uh, Twitter is really letting everybody speak to whoever they want to. We know they throttle in various ways, and we know that they um, blue checkmark uh, accounts uh, in uh, selectively based on political criteria of one kind or another. We know that they shadow ban. We know that there are all kinds of bots that they put up with and, uh, and don't call out because... Uh, that would not serve their purpose. So there's all these various ways that they unlevel the playing field, but he's wanting us to believe that if the money is out of the picture, then the playing field will be level. It's just not true. Yeah, that's the, that's the great irony here is that, uh, you know, he's saying that um, paying for reach removes that decision when, as, as you just said, Don, there are many ways in which Twitter, with their algorithms and other means of determining what who sees what, uh, the, the Twitter removes that decision. Yeah, it, it's almost like there, as long as you can pose as the referee, people let you get away with playing the role of the referee, even though you're really on the playing field and you're really scoring points. But uh, as long as you tell people you're the referee, well, you're neutral, aren't you? Um, and, and that's why people have to say, wait a minute. No, you're not. 
while internet advertising is incredibly powerful and very effective for commercial advertisers, that power brings significant risks to politics where it can be used to influence votes to affect the lives of millions. Interesting comment. I, I think he's dichotomizing political advertising versus commercial advertising. And, you know, with the implication that political advertising bad, commercial advertising good. But what we've seen, and this trend is expressed through the, as through our study of new knowledge yonder, is the politization, politi politicization of commercial advertising. And that's very evident everywhere where we're presented with scenes that reinforce a certain lifestyle choice, um, a vector of, um, lifestyle choice re regarding anything from sexual politics to just cultural affinity based on what are somewhat abstract but still there i think you know we'll have political vectors expressed through that that process of engineering consent so that we will see billboards with presenting some of these themes and we've presented some of them on our twitter site so that's another fallacy kind of buried within the text here is that, and it might even be a strategy is that commercial advertising will essentially become a sort of subconscious method of carrying on the same policy below the radar of political advertising. Yeah, I, I think you're I'm alluding to something that uh, I am wondering about here, and that is what actually goes on beneath the surface at Twitter in terms of, of screening and how these marching orders from Dorsey are, are carried out, it's, um, it's not always what we would think. We, we presume neutrality means hands off. Well, we, we know, as I said before, with Twitter, that's not really true. So you have to wonder, what, what are they going to do if... Um, somebody is very effective in their outreach on Twitter, and they're an individual who has a significant following. And a few names come to mind. I won't, um, I won't say them here, but you, know, you can imagine your own um, effective for either the left or the right. And, and Twitter comes back and says, well, wait a minute, that's a, a, a political advertising. You're engaging in political advertising. Well, it's, it's not a banner that was produced by any um, you know, GOP or Democrat Party funding, but you know, it was a meme that went out. And people, I think, might presume that Twitter is not going to um, say that's advertising, but my suspicion is that they very likely could, and they could uh, apply these determinations selectively on the fly and people could get banned for advertising when they're not even advertising, they're just sharing a meme that was produced for free. Uh, I think that there's, when we, when we read about, you know, that no political advertising is going to be allowed on Twitter, people are, um, are going to say, well, that's, that's cool. You know, Trump didn't win by, um, advertising anyway. He just had all these volunteer meme warriors. Well, I can't help but wonder if Jack is going to say, well, that's political advertising. And they just redefine terms. I find this remarkably uh, arrogant. <laughs> uh, you, you know, the statement that uh, political advertising lends power to something that can affect, to influence um, and affect the lives of millions. Uh, what about commercial advertisements for cigarettes <laughs> that cause the deaths of God knows how many people from lung cancer? Uh, very, a lot of presumption here. And uh, unless somebody has a comment, I will continue quoting the thread with this next paragraph. Internet political ads present entirely new challenges to civic discourse. Machine learning based optimization of messaging and micro targeting, unchecked misleading information, and deep fakes. All at increasing velocity, sophistication, and overwhelming scale. End quote. 
We see a collection of buzzwords that turned up again and again on the study of new knowledge, and there are other companies too. So, in fact, Twitter did acquire one of them. I'm not sure which uh, one at this point, but about six months ago or so. Um, and the, these services are being delivered below the radar. They're usually a vendor or a subsidiary that effectively is corralling the audience based upon a linguistic formula of relational logic, trying to basically track the frequency and usage of words, mostly because the sheer volume of content is so massive that no human being could possibly have the time to, to read it all at the same time. So these companies are, are making a pretty good living selling this solution. It's kind of a black box. Many of the uh, people doing this are experienced uh, military psychologists. Again, new knowledge is a pretty good example as we get into the backgrounds of the principles. And the, the buzzwords that showed up in Congress actually are mirrored here. Deep fakes was first presented during the Russiagate um, Senate IC hearing. Uh, Rene DeResta testified and with a, a whole panel of other people that were selling these concepts. So we we see these machine learning, you know, these are these are not things that Jack obviously is familiar with these things as well, but these, this is a very important paragraph in the statement to insert these ideas as is kind of a, I'm sure they, it was suggested by the vendors or by someone else besides Jack um, to make sure this was included just so these buzzwords could get out there into the, uh, into the public realm. Yeah, I just want to point out again that this is a, this is a veiled uh, posturing of being the referee. And you have to wonder, well, yeah, these things sound neutral when we read them here. Quote, unchecked misleading information. Okay, yeah, that's bad. Misleading information is bad. Then you say, have, but you have to ask, who determines whether it's misleading? And at what level? And, you know, micro-targeting, what is micro-targeting? All, all of this stuff kind of begs defining. And when it's a leftist culture or a right-wing culture that's doing the defining, we have a problem. So. I don't think that these are neutral terms. They look like they're neutral terms, but when it when the rubber meets the road, they're not. Continuing to read the thread, these challenges will affect all internet communication, not just political ads. Best to focus our efforts on the root problems without the additional burden and complexity taking money brings. Trying to fix both means fixing neither well and harms our credibility, end quote. I believe this paragraph is a foreshadow of, uh, of a future strategy and it's an incrementalism. The strategy itself seems to be a Machiavellian approach to to sort of take a take one chunk, to sort of separate the, the issue instead of attract, attacking the whole thing at once, is to piecemeal um, and and dole out the abuse sort of in smaller doses that are that are hardly noticed by by people. And this is why I think it was inserted. We we see the alliteration, or at least the punctuation, and the some of the spacing and and the way the words are constructed is being very important. I think all is the only thing that's capitalized. And this is another advantage of, of doing it in this form, not, not tweet form, but looking at the whole, the whole work as a, as a unit, which obviously was produced as a unit. And it's the only three letters that are capitalized in the entire uh, piece. And I believe that that's the central theme of paragraph five, I think is the foreshadowing is just to kind of put that out there that um, and I think subconsciously they tip their hand. I think I think there are, there is going to be more trouble ahead. This is this is kind of the little red flag that we're seeing in in paragraph five. Yeah, uh, it. What I'm hearing in that is basically when we've said it before earlier that this whole idea of removing money and making things more pure is. It's not real world. 
there money is involved in everything, the infrastructure, et cetera. So his argument that, well, if we try to fix both the money and the personal interactions that are not monetized, then we won't do either well. I would submit to you that it's actually the opposite. If money were actually um, allowed in as an amplifier, that would actually enable you to see the problems more clearly. Just in other words, if there's a, a big political ad that um, that people key off of and that it's paid for big campaign money, then there would be um, people res would either resonate with that, react against it. Um, it allows you to see the dynamics more clearly. Um, it's like, um, okay, if there's a river that is flowing and it's got some big stones in it, those big rocks are going to affect the flow of the river, no doubt about it. But it, it helps you see the movement of the water. If you just have a bunch of tiny pebbles, then you might be able to see the flow of the water, but you wouldn't be able to as easily spot what's directing the flow of the water. I think the money actually highlights for both for good and for ill what's happening and trying to remove money from the equation actually creates another variable that makes analysis more difficult. So I, I think he's actually directly wrong. I think people will, if money is allowed, they'll smell it and will react against it, both on the left and the right. There's the the whole idea of the the Trump and uh, anti-establishment movement in politics is that the establishment money shouldn't control, and so people have a smell have their feelers up for that. They have a smell test, and uh, they can smell big money. And trying to remove it outright is actually removing an important part of the. Um, the detection process the that Americans uh, should be going through. Continuing to quote the thread, for instance, it's not credible for us to say, quote, we're working hard to stop people from gaming our systems to spread misleading info, but if someone pays us to target and force people to see their political ad, well, they can say whatever they want. And then there's a little uh, winking, smiley face, end quote. Yeah, I think he's got to inject that emotional vector in there. It's one of the downsides of, of, of type uh, itself is it's devoid of emotion. And I, I get the feeling that Jack is a little bit devoid of emotion at times. He's uh, going over to the MBTI for just a second. I might as well put this in. Um, the consensus is that Jack is an ISTP or INTP, which is not surprising in a perceiving function where the S and the N are sort of balanced anyway. So the, the important the important point there is that we have an introverted thinker and um, it's the number one function which would push the feeling, the um, extroverted feeling function down the stack to uh, number four. And so, uh, Jack is a logistician. He's he's extremely uh, soft spoken and rather unemotional. But an interesting construct in paragraph six. He sort of squeezes in. I'm sure it was a it was a group effort again. Uh, the first part is is the most important, and it's again a, it's sort of a Trojan horse projection of what is you know what the the thought form is. And also, I think he's putting this out there to the public as a PR person. We're working hard to stop people from gaming our systems. Now that's, again, they're gaming, gaming our systems is a frame. And he's, he, of course, whenever you're framing a target uh, audience, you want to sneak in like a magician would sort of by sleight of hand, Sli slide your point in as an aside and then keep the sentence moving. Um, gaming our systems, well, Jack also in an interview I just listened to on Joe Rogan really was a little more honest in in his own personal reflection reflecting upon the fact that Twitter was created 
phenomenologically as they moved along. They didn't design Twitter. They didn't design hashtags. They didn't design the ampersand symbol. These things sort of came about in, in sort of just this creative process of, of phenomenology and which is more um, in agreement with the, the analysis that, that uh, Jack Dorsey is a perceiving type, not a judging type. So, and, and it's just kind of ironic. I think gaming our systems, it's, it, it doesn't, um, I think it sort of belies the fact that, that it's competition for them because they, they can't game the system if somebody else is gaming it. So the, the gaming, again, is a subconscious projection of the world, that the world is a game, that somehow these, these, these processes are games that are being played rather than um, the process of evolution of a public um utility the, the public utility itself is going through the growing pains of of addressing uh trollery and and rude behavior and things like that and i i think it'll be self-correcting if it was just let if, if they would just let it be but here here they they're trying to sort of game the system over this guilt of of having donald trump take away the presidency because of as we've arrived at on this show at least whether or not we support president trump and full disclosure, I think most of the three of us do support President Trump. Certainly the will of the people and the Constitution is supported wholeheartedly. But rather than regard that as an organic product of this sudden increase in the ability of us to talk to each other, even the three of us, you know, at least in several um, on several levels wouldn't even be talking if it weren't for this marvelous creation of uh, that Jack did not create. He It was created by, again, in, utility infrastructure that developed over the course of the 80s, the 90s, uh, coaxial cable laid everywhere. Um, so for Jack to kind of come in and sort of take control over it, um, I, I don't think, he, I don't even think he believes that. I think his committee decided to PR that as, as the frame they wanted to advance here. This is just more of the same claim of neutrality saying um, we're pure because we, we can't be bought and um, it's not about um, actually not being bought. It's um, it's about not um, it's it's about concealing your bias, and that's what Jack is openly doing here. If you had accepted money, then you could say, well, we've got limits, and both sides have reached their limit, and therefore we're neutral. I think you could have a case, but when you're doing all these other things to unlevel the playing field and not accepting money well all you're doing is you're concealing your bias so that's the way i react to that paragraph continuing to quote the thread we considered stopping only candidate ads but issue ads present a way to circumvent additionally it isn't fair for everyone but candidates to buy ads for issues they want to push so we're stopping those too Ouch. So we're, we're actually going to be experimenting with this. And you've you may have for people who have followed us on Twitter, you'll see that I have this uh, this idea to change the American uh, coinage system and, and just go to one cipher to the right of the decimal. And it's kind of a pet little pet idea, but it's sort of a I, I would say ideologically neutral issue. But again, we have a fallacy. What is an issue ad and, and where who? who draws the line jack almighty i i don't know a, an issue where does an issue ad leave and a non-issue ad start I, I mean it's just it's very vague but i think it, the the vagueness is the intent i think the this way they can come back later and um and sort of game the system to, to lift a phrase from the last paragraph and so we're stopping these two. That's how it ends. So we're stopping these two, but it's it's not a binary choice. So I don't know how you can put an on-off switch on something that's pretty much of a pretty much a gray area. Yeah, they they are trying to appear neutral when they aren't. And really, if if Twitter is a public utility, it's all this is almost begging for somebody to actually step in and say, well, we're going to actually help you remove the bias. It's, um, I'm wondering how we can get to a more neutral platform. Um, and and um, I'm not sure that, that there's a good way, 
but the all of the the algorithms that they have running in the background actually and and uh, the the people in making key decisions they need to be revealed they need to be seen for what they are um, those of us that are paying attention we know about things like shadow banning but if there is going to be a true public ownership of a public utility there has to be some way to neutralize this and the only thing i can think of really that makes sense is transparency so if they're a public company which they are then they need to make their algorithms public and some of their management processes of decision making public we need to know exactly what happens when people are banned uh, the only way we know about it is second or third hand because uh, the, the, the friends of people that are banned put on timeouts or whatever on twitter uh, the word gets around the grapevine but there's no transparency within twitter itself i think that needs to change i see a lot of gray areas here potentially for instance, the one that comes to mind is um, a Planned Parenthood center wants to advertise their abortion services, and in the same community, a pro-life organization wants to advertise their free pregnancy testing services. Uh, is Potentially, both of those could be considered issue ads and who will decide which is an issue ad and which is a services ad will hold a tremendous amount of power. Talk about you know, that one paragraph about uh, how much power it, you know affect the lives of millions. Uh, whoever decides what ads get to run, which ads fall into these categories is really holding probably more power than anybody who would uh, have the ability to pay for advertising. But continuing to quote Jack, we're well aware we're a small part of a much larger political advertising ecosystem. Some might argue our actions today could favor incumbents, but we have witnessed many social movements reach massive scale without any political advertising. I trust this will only grow, end quote. I, I think that's just a false statement completely. I, every, it, again, it hinges upon the implied definition of political advertising, which in this context, in this frame means on Twitter. But to, to make a statement that, that a, a social movement has reached massive scale without social, socially facilitated influence would be denying the humanity aspect of, of, our, of our existence. I mean, just, we're, we're social creatures and every reach that is uh, gained is, is really done through social interaction and the internet itself is just another form of that occurrence. And when a company like Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, or um, any of the Amazon through their subsidiaries in the publishing industry, when they, achieve massive scale using public infrastructure, they erect a barrier to entry. And some of this gets into the antitrust theory, but when a company like Twitter actually violates the First Amendment, they um, are uh, really running afoul of the law. In essence, the statute is, is written into the constitution. And if in the course of committing that crime, they're taking advantage of a barrier to entry that's based on public monopoly infrastructure, then I believe there's a, a case, another case to, to, uh, to address that issue in some, some manner. Uh, the other pushback would be through shareholder rights. Um, I guess shareholders would have to vote with their feet. And even though this is a marvelous product, I, we, we love Twitter. I think we're all, all three of us are participants and, um, the, my hope going forward is that the is that they um, stop trying to game the system, which is really kind of the point of this paragraph, I believe. He's trying to you know frame it in a certain way. This is very skillfully written polemic, and um, we're tr again we're just trying to point out some of the fallacies here. Yeah, one of the things that jumps out to me, and I, I, I I'm thinking about 
his underlying presumption here and where he's uh, where Dak is saying some might argue our actions today could favor incumbents. Okay, what what is the reasoning that would be behind somebody saying that? Well, it's the idea that if you want entrance into the political game, you have to pay for it. Well, you know, and he's saying some might argue that, and he's saying, well, people can't get into the game by spending money there, so therefore it's going to favor the um, the incumbent. And and he's arguing that this is not true because you've got um, this ability to um, to gain a reach through other means rather than paying for it. And that's certainly true, but that doesn't mean that um, that people should be prevented from entering using, you know, with a large amount of money. So it's, he's basically saying, um, without saying it, I think in this paragraph, Donald Trump had a lot of money of his own. He bought himself political clout with his money. We want to keep that from happening again. And I believe he's very skillfully said that without saying that. And, um, it's not political ads uh, that got Trump um, access to Twitter. It was his own tweets that were not monetized. So the argument is really shallow and uh, I think false, but it's um it resonates with a lot of people because people didn't like some people, especially those on the left, that basically trust politicians to be more pure because they are not involved in business, not involved in commerce, therefore they're not greedy, therefore they can serve the public good. Um, those that buy into that paradigm are going to like the idea of limiting advertising and preventing somebody like Donald Trump from entering into the field of politics, um, even though President Trump uh, really had an army of volunteers and didn't pay for much of his political outreach. He was he way underspent his opponent. So uh, I think there's um, not only is this false, it's false on a few different levels. And I, I'm hoping that I'm accurately perceiving what's going on under the hood here. I think I am. To continue quoting at Jack's thread, in addition, we need more forward-looking political ad regulation. Very difficult to do. Ad transparency requirements are progress, but not enough. The internet provides entirely new capabilities, and regulators need to think past the present day to ensure a level playing field." End quote. What did he just say there? I think basically he just said, we need to imagine where this is going, and What's not being said is we're the people that can imagine it because we know how this thing works. And he's saying we've got to get ahead of this and we're the visionaries that can do it. I think that's what he's saying. Yeah, I think also they might have seen the um, the growing disparity between funding the Democrat Democratic Party candidates are extremely underfunded compared to the Trump campaign this time around. And it's a pretty impressive bar graph. And then the candidates are dropping out as we as we speak today. Um, so that you never know. I mean, we're we're sort of mind reading there a little bit, but um, that could be so level. That might be the trace the tracer for the level playing field phrase. Um, the other thing, the fallacy, and there's so many of them in this in this communication. The um, Gutenberg press. I bet they had the same conversations in 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 German or whatever at that time about the uh, the power they were unleashing. Um, but this is actually the progress of, uh, of of the human spirit that we're talking about. It's uh, the I think the election itself um, was a surprise to people and the interchange of ideas that was occurring during that time. Um, people's discernment it grew and is growing. I mean, we're, we're growing as a culture. And if they think they can put the cap on this bottle, I, I think they're, I think they're wrong. They may be, they may have some short-term success. Um, but the phrase 
that everyone should take note of is political ad regulation. Uh, that That's a really scary phrase to me. So I'm not sure what he was getting at there, but um, I'm sure there, there are lots of clever workarounds that um, the people that actually run this company have access to um, will be employed in the service of their own efforts to game the system. One of the things that I want to uh, point out, um, make sure I do that before we leave this whole topic of in internet um, reach is that this is wave three in something of a, of a technology over a long period of time uh, entrance into politics. Um, and John Donald Trump is the, the third president to have been made basically by a new communications medium. The first was FDR and radio, and the second was JFK and television, and the third is Trump and internet. So what happens after every one of these breakthroughs, you have a, a, a group of people that then scramble for control of the levers of power. These are new lever, levels of power that have emerged. There was radio, and then there was control of the radio waves that, and the control of the radio um, technology that ensued after that, all kinds of specialization in terms of radio marketing. And then it was television. The, the, uh, the JFK versus Nixon was the breakthrough moment there. And now we've got President Trump broke through with a much lower budget because he had, as an entrepreneur, the ability to spot people that, were, that had skill in riding the wave of internet communications. Brad Parscale um, does know his stuff and was a, a help there. And uh, but there was just a grassroots movement because um, President Trump knew how to utilize that medium, even though he's older, he's uh, somebody who thinks outside the box. So what's happening now is Jack Dorsey and other people are trying to enter into this point of technological breakthrough power, and they're trying to uh, control the way in which that power is utilized. And uh, I think it's um, it may eventually happen that there is more control developed there, and they're certainly doing their best. But I don't think it's at the point where it can be controlled. And my hope is that it won't be controlled because the internet is a more of a um, interpersonal and less centralized uh, communication mechanism than either of the, my previous two examples. So Time will tell how this all shakes out, but I agree with Ken that the uh, the political ad regulation is a scary phrase, and we need to be aware of that. We want to fight for our ability to um, speak as individuals and go around these um, big rocks in the stream, as I was using, uh, illustrating them in a previous segment. I have read that copyright laws were an attempt to limit the power that was unleashed with uh, the Gutenberg Press that in the, uh, before books could be mass produced, only very wealthy people could obtain books and uh, there, therefore there was very easy control of information in that way and that uh, copyright laws were instituted as a reaction to that so that the flow of information could be curtailed as desired. Continuing to quote at Jack, we'll share the final policy by 1115, including a few exceptions. Ads in support of voter registration will still be allowed, for instance. We'll start enforcing our new policy on 1122 to provide current advertisers a notice period before this change goes into effect. It, interesting, they obviously took pains to put in the voter registration, which seems like a benign statement, but I think they could easily, um, if, if someone on the left is so inclined, couch a, an appeal to voter registration in the imagery and uh, psychological frame of um, orange man bad or what, you know, in some context, and we're used to seeing the cultural context expressed in art, um, in um, various forms of sexual politics, advancing certain things that are purported to be related to political issues. 
sneakers, for example, or baseball, or, you know, I mean, it's, this is sort of the trend and it is expressed in the new knowledge. Um, their new business is really to team up with advertisers and to make their brand a values oriented statement rather than a product advertising statement. So um, the other thing I, I think we'll, we'll probably see um, an increase in the ambiguity and, and in the enforcement of this policy as well. I, who knows what form it will take, but it's pretty obvious that they, it, it, keying off something Don said, I, I, I kind of mix, go both ways on the Trump issue, whether it was, it was Donald Trump himself or whether it was the internet. And I tend to think the pushback to the Hillary Clinton uh, the possibility of another Bush Clinton election was just unthinkable to many people, and they got a chance to express it. And finally, like that great movie network, people did get a chance to yell back at the TV and uh, to open their windows and, and freely communicate their displeasure in an open forum. And I don't I think that the uh, the people that control these content providers and they are content providers. Uh, tw Twitter is not really an infrastructure uh, item it's it's running on another platform but i think they feel some guilt over this this election and and that's what i'm advancing here is that sure donald trump is a marvelous communicator but this new interchange and low voter turnout also at that time are i think we're, we're also factors in in uh in propelling donald trump to the white house and i think they they just don't want it to happen again, or they don't want to be responsible for it happening again. So they're sort of tiptoeing away from uh, the free interchange that, that accomplished that aim in the 2016 cycle. Yeah, I, I do want to um, mention that uh, Trump himself recognized that there was a movement that began and that, that he was riding a wave. And uh, he, he, uh, he is a skilled marketer, but he didn't create the movement. He recognized it and, and knew how to um, capture at least some of its power. So um, that is certainly uh, part of what's going on here. But the other thing I wanted to point out from that paragraph, uh, uh, like uh, Ken just did, is that ads in support of OJ registration thing is that um, I think anybody that's... Um, relatively aware of politics knows that new voter registrations have tended to favor Democrats in the past, but that may be changing. So uh, Twitter's pretty much transparent bias in favor of the Democrats has tended to want to capitalize on getting new voters. So I could see that in Jack's mind that the the idea of broadening the base of politics would play in his favor and play out according to his own uh, and Twitter's, um, the culture of Twitter, there, the, the bias that exists there. So um, although new voter registration voter registration sounds neutral it actually isn't um although again i think that may be changing we do have with uh with the current uh, movement of the anti-establishment and uh, uh recognition of that there is an awakening going on we do have new voters joining the republican party so it may not be quite as simple, but in, historically, it has been a, something that has favored Democrats. Continuing with the final paragraph, the final tweet in this thread, a final note. This isn't about free expression. This is about paying for reach. And paying to increase the reach of political speech has significant ramifications that today's democratic infrastructure may not be prepared to handle. It's worth stepping back in order to address. Again, it looks like a hamstring applied to the growing Republican coffers in moving into the 2020 election cycle. And 
also it, uh, the fallacy I think is when is just in the word itself is in the word paying and everybody takes that as sort of a self-evident phrase but it, you know what is money money is life energy and and even today where the three of us are sitting here you know foregoing other opportunities to make money to to devote time to our our passion for psychology and communication and and uh, so essentially we're always every everybody that gets up in the morning is paying for reach it is to, to leave a legacy to to uh, live a life that has meaning and uh, especially as you know with advancing age i think people are are leveraging their wisdom and attempting to um not necessarily influence the political process as much as just express express their own uh, path in life and their own calling and to try to leave an impact in major historical figures sometimes leave a much larger impact but every human being that walks the face of the earth leaves leaves a legacy and um, it becomes a, an important part of being a human being I think and I, I'm not sure what Jack's talking about anymore in in most of this um, communication although it's quite self-evident that if you just take it on the face of it but there's there's a lot more going on, and it's it's almost like a, uh, a, a a cake with this frosting on it that's just not quite right when you peel away the frosting, and there's there's just nothing here, and unfortunately, but just control and and manipulation, um, and I think just advice to Jack as an ex stockholder myself is is it's a marvelous tool i think i think it's it's all it's in the news every single day and on every level it's probably the the hottest product we've ever seen but it's being completely ground into um into dust by factionalizing and bringing in vendors who actually specialize in factionalizing the audience and um those vendors many of them are connected to the the uh, outgoing Obama administration, and we'll, we'll get into that in probably part two. I think we've we've covered enough today for the listener, but please stay tuned. And and uh, I think in the next the next show is a follow up. We're going to look at these vendors a, a little more closely, not the ones that we see. We see Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, but there's a vast network of of service providers and vendors that operate below the radar, and and their impact is is extremely significant and they are controlling the algorithms and they are including in their products a trojan horse objective that i don't even think a lot of the owners of these companies realize um is being foisted upon them for instance the companies that are accepting these these ridiculous ad propositions that create um boycotts of their product the gillette razor blade uh situation and um basically these companies are carrying out socially engineered um consent operations and really ruining the brands that they're polluting with these these messages and factionalizing we see it with the factionalizing of baseball during the uh, world series and these are american institutions where everyone could uh, coexist all races all all political beliefs, and it's not Donald Trump who's creating this. It's the reaction to a person they've never met. And uh, maybe President Trump occasionally plays into the uh, into the hand that um, uh, that they're able to sort of capitalize on, and um, that could be we could consider that as possibly counterproductive to the longer term goal of. Of uniting the country and in, in the and in making keeping America great. Keeping America great means also emotional stability in our in our uh, social interactions. Uh, but I, I would pu really put the onus on the thought crafters uh, primarily who are who are re, you know repackaging this cognitive uh, thinking and, and selling it as truth. Yeah, my final thought here is uh, I want to key off something that that Ken said that having to do with that it's not really it, it there is and we'll be getting into this more later it's the the unseen the um the hidden factors involved and it's basically coming down to establishment versus non-establishment 
And the and people presume, I think Jack's basic presumption here is that the establishment equals money. Well, yes, that's true, but um, it's not a 100% lock. In other words, yeah, if you if you are establishment, you would tend to have money, um, but there with the decentralization of, of input as Twitter exemplifies, you're going to have the opportunity for a small amount of money to go a longer way. And uh, Trump's candidacy really exemplifies that. So in arguing against money, he's actually, arg uh, involvement in political ads on Twitter, he's actually arguing against the um, use of the establishment's prime, primary weapon against them. And we can see how, w using television as an example, how in the beginning that of, of the me development of the medium, there was a lot of creativity involved, but towards the end and the cycle of television that we're in now, we're that, that creativity has been largely squeezed out in the news reporting area to the point where the news medium is well known on television, is well known for producing talking points, but doing a very little in-depth investigative reporting. Uh, and that's all currently mostly being, um, uh, in, the true investigative reporting is being done by independent people and using the internet as a, a means of releasing it. So what I'm saying is, we're in the beginning stage of a new medium in which it's easier to turn the tables using a little bit of leverage, money being the leverage, and Jack is trying to prevent a little bit of leverage from uh, turning the tables. And uh, I think it's, um, it's pretty transparent if you look at it. He's, he wants to be in control. He wants Twitter to be in control, and he doesn't want to uh, actually open the door and uh, let another Donald Trump potentially turn the tables. Yeah, and I'd say just in conclusion, I, I regard this statement as, as a construct, and I believe there's another shoe to drop here. And this was, this was just a, a kind of a, an entree using sort of an anti-capitalist frame and um, appealing to a certain segment, a very large segment, actually a portion of, of the, the base that he, uh, that, that does regard him as authoritative. And um, the other shoe to drop will be, will not look like this. It won't, it won't be about money. It will be about um, the actual issue itself. But this was just, this was sort of the first step. And it was, it was a, a, just a way to get the foot in the door and introduce some of the conceptual um, topics that, that will come up later. And it, it just, it echoes completely the, the, the things that we've encountered with the, vendor, again, the vendors, the new knowledge and, and some of these others. But I think the, most of the problems he's addressing are self-correcting. And, and frankly, I don't find political advertising to be that convincing. Um, I, most people, I think, sort of zip through the ad. So I don't know why he, re, that's why I'm looking, I'm trying to find the reason for this to happen. And I think it's, it's not related to political advertising. Let me just say it, say it that way. What do you think, Cindy? I have a little anecdote uh, regarding how much influence Twitter exerts with their algorithms and so on. This morning, I, uh, when I first logged onto Twitter, it was my, it was just my home feed. And I saw quite a few tweets referring to the uh, yesterday's election. And one that I noticed particularly was uh, one topic was gerrymandering. And I saw several tweets regarding uh, one party's gerrymandering of uh, Virginia's voting districts. And <laughs> so I, I did a few things and... Uh, and I, I remembered those tweets and I wanted to go back and find some of them and comment on some of them. When I did searches for Virginia gerrymandering, 
the only tweets that came up were uh, tweets pertaining to the other political party. My home feed showed me one set, one political party, and my search gave me tweets about the other political party. Um, that can't be a coincidence, and I had a very similar thing happen. I, uh, I saw a uh, map, a county map of the United States that was red and uh, said something like, uh, try impeaching with this, or so, you know, because evidently there's a lot of support for um, for Donald Trump in the you know what's considered flyover country. Uh, so again, that was in my feed, and when I went back to do a search for it, I literally spent 15 minutes finding that map again, trying different search terms. Um, so it's it's very obvious that Twitter is manipulating information and Twitter is using its awesome power to show and not show what it wants to show and not show. And for them to deny the use of, you know, the, an equal access through advertising is, um, very, I, I rarely use the word unfair, but it, this is very unfair, and uh, it certainly does not ensure a level playing field. It it ensures a very slanted playing field. So that's uh, <laughs> that's my two cents worth. Yeah. Again, I will um, just reiterate what I said earlier: is that we, and what what Ken was saying is that. I'm not sure why Jack is doing this. Well, my my hunch is that it's it's all about posturing. It's all about playing the referee. It's all about you know wanting to to have the moral high ground or have a claim to it. And um, hopefully, what we're doing today is um, helping people see well, not is all all that it appears to be. So maybe this. Um, getting the money out of politics is not quite as easy as what Jack says it is. And maybe because money is, as Ken said, a representation of our energy, it's not really possible to get the money out of anything. It's a part of our lives. And uh, we have to learn to trust the smell detectors uh, that every American has, every human being has. We're able to ignore the the crass uh, attempts to buy your vote and we're able to look a little deeper and uh, I, I would wonder why doesn't Jack trust the people to use their own smell detectors and why does he feel the need to um, actually pretend like he's creating something more pure because he's doing that well uh, this is sort of paternalistic isn't it sort of uh, pretending like you're the parent and, and you're trying to manage your children. Uh, I don't really like that. That rubs me the wrong way. So, dear curious seekers and experts, this concludes our discussion of the recent Twitter political ad ban. Please leave comments and let us know what you think. Also, if you have enjoyed this discussion, please click like, subscribe to us on YouTube, subscribe to us on BitChute, and follow us on Twitter. Once again, thanks for joining us, and until next time, take care.